Hi guys, it's me. I know I'm sorry, I apologize. I should have called before I disappeared for the last year and a half. Uh, so I guess I owe you an explanation about why I haven't been updating my YouTube channel. Um, the most simple answer is that I finished Green Monk. And as I explained in a previous video called Why YouTube, the real reason I started uh, this channel was to promote Green Monk. But um, truthfully, that's not really a sufficient answer because there was other reasons why I was YouTubing. And I really, uh, I really did it. I maintained this channel. I created new content because it was something that for me was a, a legitimate, meaningful um, expression, form of expression. Something that was as meaningful to me as, as making comics. Um, you know, I, I really appreciated people, that people took interest in it and that people followed and subscribed and, and left comments. And I, I really loved the kind of gang of regular faces that always showed up in the comments to, to talk about what I, what I happened to discuss. So I'm grateful for you for, for being those people, for taking interest in the channel. And hey, I'm grateful that you're here now, that you're still interested in, in what I might have to say. So, you know, thanks for, for being here. Um, that having been said, you know, there did come a point where I had to ask myself why I was YouTubing. There took up a lot of time. There wasn't much of a monetary return, you know, and I'd finished Green Monk and then the monetary return for that also wasn't, wasn't great. And that's not to say that monetary return is the only thing that, that matters, but, you know, my wife did uh, decide to go back to work so I could uh, make a comic book and I felt like, hmm, I, I, it would be nice to have someone to show for, for all that time. So anyway, that kind of left me in a place in my life where I was doing a lot of evaluating of my life. And I think it's something you could fairly, pretty fairly call a um, midlife crisis. And as is typical of midlife crises, I was reevaluating my life up to this point. I was, I was trying to figure out what the rest of my life is going to be. And a lot of these questions are still open questions. But at that specific point in time, there was a lot of the distress you might associate with a midlife crisis. It was, it was painful and there were difficult aspects of it and, and some dark moments. So fortunately, I was very lucky to stumble into some, some good healing places. Um, I had some experiences that ended up leading to some very, very healthy paradigm shifts. And if you're really, interesting, really interested in knowing about that, I have a few lengthy, very lengthy blog posts um, where you can read about that. I've included links to those below. So where does that leave me now? Well, I'm unemployed, no job prospects on the horizon, in the midst of a pandemic with legitimate, you know, social unrest on the streets. So uh, what better time to start a podcast? So that's what I'm doing. I'm, I'm here to introduce a new podcast. It's going to be called How to Be an Artist. And in many ways, it's going to be a culmination of a lot of the ideas that I've explored uh, in this channel over the last few years. So if you follow this channel for any length of time, you're gonna get a general idea about um, some of the things we'll be exploring. Um, but if I could try and be a little bit more concise about what this channel is gonna be about, it's about this thing that I see that is really lacking in contemporary art culture. And this, this art culture that is very much kind of inter intermediated digitally over these social media platforms and over the internet um, I feel like we have a very strong emphasis on the ways that art um, is individualistic and materialistic, and, and it is those things, those things I think play an important role, but I really think we do not value enough the um, uh, communal and spiritual aspects of art. So um, that's kind of a, a basic topic I want to explore on this podcast, and, and of course I'm going to be talking to lots of artists. We're going to be talking about making art and how you make art and why you should make art and things you should think about and why art matters. But I'm also going to be talking to other people that are thinking about other aspects of life and how they, how they interconnect with art. So we'll be talking about you know, urbanism and community and philosophy and, and spirituality and all these other things that kind of intersect into this place we call art and, and affect kind of these uh, individual um, points of view and voices that, that we each have. So I, I hope it's something that, that you find interesting. I mean, I'm, I'm just kind of like rolling the dice that the stuff I'm curious about and the stuff that I'm finding interesting that, that you're going to find interesting as well. So um, for the inaugural episode, 
Uh, my guest is Jersey Drozd, and a lot of way Jersey epitomizes these values that I'm, I'm talking about. You know, besides being a, a master storyteller, uh, he's also this, a brilliant and really generous uh, educator. He's a, um, you know, a champion for comic art, and he also happens to be just like a really good person. So he's also like a prolific podcaster with lots of experience podcasting. So he was great for the first episode because he was kind of like my, my podcasting training wheels. So thank you, Jersey, for being my podcasting training wheels. Um, anyway, if you like what you hear in this episode, of course, you can like this video. You can subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. But, you know, if you have another place where you listen to podcasts, you know, please like, subscribe, leave good reviews there if you think it is worthy of good reviews. Um, and if you really want to support um, the podcast, I've created a Patreon. I've actually retooled my old Patreon to be just a Patreon for how to be an artist. Um, the link for that is also below. So um, let me know what you think in the comments. I'm going to return to actually answering comments in, in my YouTube comments. So I guess you can look forward to that. Um, I'm happy to be back. Thanks for sticking around and thanks for following. And I really sincerely hope you enjoy how to be an artist. How to be an artist. Step one, giving yourself permission. I don't know, I'm a little bit nervous. I mean, normally when you do your podcast, they're, they're pretty well, well planned out. So yeah, like, the, I they, regret this? His, no, well, you remember I used to do the comics are great show and yeah. that, that had like next to no structure. I just would walk in with, okay, here's three things I think we can talk about. Mm -hmm. and I would let the guests know that that's what I'm thinking about talking about, and I would say, like, be, f feel free to derail it, do whatever you want with it. Um, but often, 90% of the time, they would show up and be like, yeah, just hit me with your questions, and we'll see what we can do with it. Oh, cool. Um, so, but, like, the only prep I did was I would say, like, here's, like, three things I notice about their stuff or their worldview that I notice nobody else does. And mm -hmm. then now I'm going to, I'm going to push them on it and say, why, why do you, why do you think of it this way and not that way? And that was the whole approach. And it, that was probably the most like intellectually challenging and stimulating show I ever did. Cause I always felt like I was in the edge of falling off the bike. Oh, know? sure. <laughs> I mean, I really like I really like comics is are, uh, what is it? Comics are great. Comics are great. Yeah. Comics I mean, I great. really enjoyed, um, the episodes I got to participate on where it was like Dave, Dave Roman, Casey, mm -hmm. myself, and you kind of talking about ideas. I, those were so much fun. Yeah. I thought those were a ball yeah. to do. Yeah, that was the original concept was it was going to be like a, a rotating roundtable show. And then uh -huh. it turned into a straight up interview show later on, like by like episode 14 or something. I started just uh -huh. doing like one-on-one -on -one interviews with people. But yeah, um, but yeah, that was the, 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 the whole idea was is like, let's trust ourselves that we have the presence of mind and attentiveness <laughs> and intellectual rigor to to navigate a topic in a way that's interesting to listen to and has some utility. But if we fail, we'll forgive ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> sure. And maybe this is like my naivete or like hubris of, of like, hey, I, I've been wanting to do a podcast forever. I should really just do one. And having this kind of mm -hmm. observation that I'm sure a million people have had that you sit down with a friend and you're like, wow, that was such a cool conversation. We should have been recording yeah. that the whole time and thinking like, oh, it's going to be that easy. <laughs> All you got to do is like, is get the recorder going and you're going to have like a great conversation. And it gets a little more difficult when you aren't looking face to face and you're sitting in front yep. of this very contrived recording setup, you know? Oh, totally. And, and there's the express purpose of it being for transmission to other people. Whereas like in, when you have that exciting conversation face to face, you don't have that conceit, right? Sure. Um, but but I will say the moment you said I'm thinking of starting a podcast, like my my heart was a flutter. I was like, oh my oh, gosh, if there's anybody that, <laughs> that I could listen to for hours. Aww. It's Brandon, uh, in in partially because you and I have spent many hours talking about storytelling, philosophy, life, and uh -huh. all that stuff, right? And cool. I loved every second of it. Um, I've always thought of you as like a spiritual and philosophical brother uh, in oh, a lot cool. of ways. Oh, I really appreciate so, that. But also because like you have a kind of um, 
if you, you used the word hubris earlier, I would say you have this weird duality of hubris and humility in that you'll freely admit that you'll go back and listen to a podcast that you are on. Because <laughs> you're like, I want to hear how it turned out. You know, where most That's, people are like, yeah. oh, I never, li- I never listen to anything that I do because I, I, I'm much too busy to actually reflect on what I actually do in the world. <laughs> no, there's definitely like an ego thing where I like, I like listening to myself talk. Uh, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes it's bad because I'll listen to something and I'm like, oh my gosh, that's just a disaster. I'm not stringing two, any two ideas together at all there. Um, but I, I did want to say, so I was kind of thinking about it and I want to kind of maybe pitch and this, this can go out to the world as kind of like, uh, the concept of the podcast. And, um, I, I think you're a good first guest to have on the podcast because I think you're kind of representative of this idea, uh, that, that I think is super important and is, and is just not getting uh, addressed a lot. Um, you know, at least like in the art community. So, um, maybe I'll give a little bit of background, like how the concept for this, this podcast formed and then kind of, kind of talk a little bit about more about what I'd like it to be. So, you know, oh, I'm super I, interested, interested in this. Yeah. Yeah. So I did like a YouTube channel for a couple of years and that was kind of my way of, of kind of getting, getting my ideas out. And, you know, it was meant to be kind of self-promotional, that type of thing, but exploring lots of ideas. And I'm sure you've gone through this, this issue that as soon as you start, um, trying to think about what content to fill, you know, there's, there's like the low hanging fruit. You're like, Oh, I can talk about this. I can do a tutorial about this, you know, mm-hmm. like motivation, like, Oh, you want to be an artist. Here's how you start, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and little by little, I found that I, as I would address a certain topic, whether it was motivation or finding ideas or um, getting better as, as an artist, I would, I would sit down and think, okay, well, what is the issue? What, what has stood in my way? How have I figured this out? And eventually, you start discovering that you are getting into different areas that are kind of outside the silo of art. You're like, okay, now I need to, need to start thinking about economics. I need to start thinking about psychology. I need to start thinking about spirituality and all these other mm-hmm. things that you start addressing. And so it ends up kind of being this like mind map where it's like, okay, hey, I'm starting with art, but then I'm seeing that this is much more about a discussion about life in general, about what is it that I want from life? How is it that art fits into all that? Um, and there's a metaphor I like, and this is from, have you ever watched that Joseph Campbell and um, Bill... Bill What's Moyers, Bill Moyers the, interview. Bill, yeah. The power of myth. Yeah. The power of myth interview. So I was watching that with a friend uh, a few months back and just happened to watch an episode that was just like right up, right up my alley in terms of what I was thinking about at that time. Um, but he talks about, um, he references black elk, elk speaks and how black elk, uh-huh. I can't remember the mountain he stands on, but when he's having his kind of vision, he's standing on a mountain, you know, and it's a mountain that's specific to, the geography where he was from and where he lived. And so it would make more much sense if I remembered that exact mountain, the name (laughs) of the mountain, but kind of the point he makes is that black elk realizes that that's the center of the universe where he is, is the center of the universe. And he kind of has this vista of the universe from where he's standing. So I kind of think that relates to what I'm trying to do in a couple of ways, as far as like art becomes this vantage point. So it's no longer about like, let's explore the silo of art. Like let's look right. at like what it means to be an artist, but we're standing from the vantage point of art and we're looking out and we're seeing like, what is it? What does life mean um, to be someone that calls themselves an artist um, from that vantage point? And you see everything up, up from that vantage point. It's, it's clearly, it's not just about that, that silo of making art. So that's what I'm interested in. Um, I'm kind of tentatively, I kind of think I want to call the podcast how to be an artist. Um, mm. because it's, it's not so much about the practice of making art as much as like thinking be. about what it means to be that person. Right. Yeah. yeah, um, yeah, and yeah. I just, I kind of thought of you as someone that is emblematic of this as far as the way that you live your life. Um, Oh my gosh, what a kind very, thing to say. <laughs> very thoughtful and lovingly, but for you making art is not like, it's not a scheme, you know, it's something that's very much part of who you are. <laughs> who you, are. <laughs> you know, it's like, I, 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 I always wonder if, if I'm, if I'm guileless or if I'm just naive and I think it's probably <laughs> like I'm oscillating between the two. <laughs> yeah. We all, we all go through phases, you know? Um, 
but you know, you, you approach making art and life in a very loving way, in a very generous way. Oh my gosh. So, um, that's, that's kind of emblematic about the kind of things I'm thinking about as far as what it means to be an artist, how you live that type of life, how you try to reconcile that with the fact that you live in a world where it's like, you also got to pay the bills, whatever. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, it's, it's less of less meant to be less of a, a podcast or in a discussion about specific strategies for doing X, Y, Z, but just kind of like talking with people that I think are interesting people that kind of exist within that, that general, you know, stratosphere of, of making art or, or even things on the, on the fringe, maybe at some point. Um, oh, yeah, I'm so glad of, you're doing this because more, more artists need to have that conversation because yeah, I, I, I think when I was younger, like even when like younger in the sense of like when you and I first met, like what, 10 years ago now, uh huh. I, I used to think of it as I'm just never off the clock. My artist is my, my artist is my identity, and everything I do is going to be uh, viewed through that lens of me being an artist, which was like a very kind of stern and severe kind of approach to thinking about it. But now, as I get older, I'm thinking more of it in terms of integration. It's more of an mm-hmm. integrated approach. Sure. And so it's still through that lens, but it has it's less to do with well, I am always at attention because I always have to be aware of how this can help my art and how this can inform my art, and it's more of a gentle trusting that well, this will inform my art by virtue of the fact that it's my experience, and the art that I do will also have an effect on the world. So I need to be mindful and thoughtful about the way that I do the art that I do. Um, so, so so that the the, the distinctions, I think in my in my younger days, the distinctions were more clear, and I was fighting against them. And mm. now the distinctions have vanished more and more, and I'm not really struggling with it at all. I'm just letting it be what it wants to be. Does that make sense? Does that sound oh. like frou frou? No, that sounds like you're just describing my last ten years of life too. So <laughs> 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 we're we're on, on the same page in a sense. I mean, I, I I've been there's this thing I've been trying to like put my finger on for for quite a few years, which I think I tried to explore a little bit in my YouTube channel, but. Um, I think we kind of both emerged within the same milieu as far as like early internet days when it was like mm-hmm. a lot of hope and like, wow, there's this potential for this world where there's all this access to free, awesome things and people are just going to make art and share it and it's going to be mm-hmm. great. And there was very much a culture and like a dogma that emerged as far as the, the internet culture related to art that kind of... Mm-hmm. Um, expressed what it meant to be an artist in a certain way and it was very much this kind of culture of you need to be 100 focused 100 percent focused on being an artist um you need to like be drawing all the time uh you know it was very very focused on um making a living as an artist so being like Mm -hmm. oh here's the way you break in here's how you like make a buck as an artist here's how you sell your stuff you know here's how you make it here's how you build your here's how you build your personal brand so that you can exactly. sell yourself as an artist, yeah, yeah. Here's how you find B- your ten thousand true followers or whatever, you know. Oh yeah, yeah, that one too. Yeah, and I'll, I mean that's not to say that there isn't a lot of stuff, uh, a lot of merit to a lot of those ideas and things I learned and, and benefited from. Um, it's like this very empowering. Uh, it was this very empowering time, you know. I wouldn't be the artist mm-hmm. I am today without just this access to amazing free resources and connections to people and and things like that. Uh, But at the same time, like there was something kind of dogmatic about it and there was something kind of restrictive about it and something where it's like, okay, we're, we're missing something here. Like there's another angle to this that that we're not seeing. And part of that is we're overly commercializing, um, making art, we're making ourselves into brands, you know, we're kind of fitting, fitting these things into this category this narrow category that maybe don't fit in that category, you know? Yeah. It's, it's funny, like something, again, this is like when I think about like how I've changed as a, as an artist today versus then is today I get really nervous when people start dealing in idioms. Right. Mm, like, what do you mean? When, when when mean? I, well, well, like, like an idiomatic expression or some kind of like, um, cultural jargon for what they're trying i just need to find my ten thousand true fans i guess i haven't found my ten thousand true fans yet that kind of thing you know like <laughs> gotta do those because, ten thousand hours god you, yeah you know gladwell said after all yeah you know and it, it, and while i acknowledge the utility of that kind of concretization of abstract ideas uh i get nervous when we start throwing them around willy-nilly because it it runs the risk of creating unexamined assumptions 
or reductive mm-hmm. thinking, right? Yeah. And so, uh, so whenever somebody starts using that kind of jargonistic or like uh, it, idiomatic expressions, I, 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 the hairs on my neck stand up just a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yeah. Part of that, I mean, at least for me, part of that is is also just like I that has been me. You know, part of that you hear yeah. someone else saying that, and you're just like, well, that was me. That was me. Yeah. <laughs> oh, very ago. much. You Very know. much so. Yeah, I'm I'm super busted on that. And I and I remember talking way back in the early days of the Art and Story podcast. It was the first one I ever did, what, 2007 with Mark mm-hmm. Rudolph. And uh, we talked about building our brand all the time on that show. I remember <laughs> it. I love oh that show. I've told you that before, <laughs> but I should mention just like to to the whole world, like how much I love like the original Art and Story. Because um, mm-hmm. it was a time... Uh, when like there was podcasting was still very much like a wild, wild west. And there was yeah. a lot of just like very vanilla sounding podcasts. Um, yeah. but it, it was great. Art and story was, was great because it was about comics. It wasn't just about comics. It was about making comics by people yeah. that were making comics. You guys were talking about it. You cared about it. You're passionate about it, but it was also, um, you guys just had good chemistry. Like of all these other vanilla yeah. podcasts, I'm just like, I know exactly who these two guys are. And I like these two guys, you know? Yeah. 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 Like you couldn't, you I, couldn't as a creator have invented a better kind of like, um, combination and, and, and contrast and personality. So I was, I was very, very, uh, frequent listener, you know, back in, back when it was yeah. first out. I remember you, you interacted with the show a lot in its early days. Uh, cause yeah. I, I knew you on Twitter for a long time and it wasn't until like 2010 at, um, kids read comics festival that you, you showed up. And that was where we met for the first time face to face. But I think you were even on the show a couple times before that. Um, yeah. Yeah. I tried to insinuate myself on. So there's definitely like some self-promotional aspects <laughs> where it's like, I like this podcast. I want to try to see if I can get on this podcast. But I mean, to, to, I don't want to like totally bash myself throughout this whole thing saying like my younger self yeah. was dumb because I don't think my younger self was dumb. I think he had some bright ideas. And one of them was that I bought in wholesale into the democratization aspect of Internet culture. Like the idea mm-hmm. that the, 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 the scarcity model is vanishing and now yeah. everybody is on an, an equal footing to be able to express themselves and quality suddenly matters much, much more. And there isn't a small group of people who determine what quality looks like. Like that was exciting to me. And I bought into that idea hundred percent. And when it came to doing the art and story podcast, my personal, I can't speak for Mark, but my personal rubric was, do they demonstrate sincere enthusiasm for thinking hard? You know, (laughs) then, then they have, they have a place to be a part of this thing. And we should, we should elevate them as we would anybody else. So like, like you, uh, Jeremy Burley, Luis Escobar, all these people who I became acquaintances and friends with, was because like they showed up and I I didn't care what their, if they had any kind of, if they wanted to call it insinuating, sure. But (laughs) did they show up and demonstrate a sincere enthusiasm for thinking hard that I want that person around me, right? Especially if they come off even smarter than me, that's the best. (laughs) That means I'm going to level up. Yeah, no, that's, that's all nice. Yeah. And I don't, I I mean, I think you're right in certain sense that like this kind of like early internet, early podcasting culture you know, while there's things to criticize about it, there's still things about it, things about it that I think are, are, are right on track, you know? So, Mm -hmm. you know, you talk about democratization of art, excuse me, access, uh, access to the tools and things like that. Um, I think all of that's been fantastic. It's just a matter of like, okay, there's some other, there's some other things we need to figure out to really make this hum, you know? Yeah. Uh, and I think one of those things is definitely like, creating realistic expectations for what it's going to mean if you decide you want to focus on making art as far as like uh, supporting yourself with that art or being able to keep that, make that sustainable. Um, Yeah. So, I mean, I think a lot of people get their hopes up about like that Patreon page and that you're going to be living off, you know, your, your subscriptions (laughs) to a page or something like that, you know? Um, or, or that, that like, it's just a matter of like, set it and forget it. And now the income comes and I can just make the things I want to make, yeah. which it's possible. That's, that's a possibility, Yeah. but, um, it's, it's highly unlikely. And what you've just signed up for is another job, right? Absolutely. Um, yeah. And something that may not pay anything. And so you have to really think about carefully about like, is this something that's, that has, um, payoffs and benefits on its own, regardless of whether or not I'm, I'm making some sort of living off of this 
And what, and well, how do you define what pay is? Like, is, is this something that I do that I get such pleasure out of that any money I make is an incidental value? Or is this something where I'm really trying to make like a, a marketable, like or art with some element of service to it that has an intended audience? Therefore, now I got to start thinking about, well, how do I make that sustainable? Right. Yeah. Um, and I think, I think that's something that I didn't have a very clear sense of as a younger artist or a beginning artist. I just, well, well, you just make good art and then people will give you money for it. That's all. <laughs> you know? And there, there's something to that. I mean, you, maybe there, you there is. Get, yeah, there's a naivete to that, but also like, that's not a bad place to focus. If you really just focus on making like <laughs> stuff you love and cool stuff, maybe, yeah. But the part that maybe falls apart is when the expectation that people are going to pay you for it, <laughs> you know, yeah. you can make stuff that you're well, very, very proud of and that you go to your deathbed, like being very satisfied with, you know, and maybe not make well, much I, money from it. I think that that that's a fine mindset when starting out. But I, the, 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 again, once again, I, I I'm smelling peril in the room and like, mm-hmm. I've, I've heard conversations with, with successful artists of various stripes and they'll say, well, you just make good work. And the opportunities will come. I'm like, ah, that makes me so uncomfortable because you're 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 removing a whole lot of complexity from the picture. Two, you're saying that you are the only reason you're successful, which that must feel great. And three, yeah. you're kind of indirectly saying that if I'm not successful, that's my fault. Yeah, <laughs> which that's true. That I'll acknowledge. I'll own what I own when it comes to that, right? But also, like, there's other factors. You can't sum it up that simply. Yeah, and it's there's there's like a, a sampling problem. This I, one of the very first things <laughs> I ever heard Nassim Taleb talk about, and I'm kind of a big disciple. I've become like a, a admitted kind of disciple of his stuff. Like, I just I return to his his like thoughts so much that I'm just like, okay, that's what I am. I mean, maybe I don't like the <laughs> idea that I'm such a groupie of someone, but I just ha- have to kind of admit that's that's the case. One of the very uh-huh. first things I said that make my ear made my ears perk up is he is he was talking about the exact same principle and he talks about like the whole idea of um, I can't remember what the book is it's one of these like get rich books or like it's not the millionaire next door but it's it's basically talking about they interviewed a bunch of millionaires and they're like okay what did you guys do to become millionaires it's like oh you know I, I get up early I I have a schedule I work hard it's like oh that's the formula the formula for being a millionaire is you get up early you work hard. And he kind of makes this point that there's a sampling problem. What you really need to look yeah. at is you need to look at what like people that are getting up early, working hard. And if they all like how many of them become millionaires, you know, because obviously right. millionaires, they maybe ne- don't necessarily know the reasons they became a millionaire. They're just looking at this stuff and maybe it correlates. But how many other thousands of people are doing the exact same stuff they're doing and are not millionaires? So I mean, right. it's kind of the same principle. And, 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 yeah, and it's not to say that working hard isn't part of the equation, right? It, that is part yeah. of the equation, I'm sure. But like, let's let's factor in other things that are at work here. It, it's it's not as simple. It, it's simple and reductive to say like suddenly like, wow, you just make good work and the opportunities will happen. Um, th- that that that's a it's an incomplete picture, and it makes me nervous when people talk that way. <laughs> yeah, as it, as it should, you know. <laughs> so maybe that that's our kind of job is to let people know that like you know. Um, yeah, the story, I let, I kind of think like the story of, of, you know, JK Rowling or George Lucas, like how they became these people that created, um, kind of this mythology that's permeated all culture. I'm sure their story mm-hmm. looks pretty similar to lots of other people that, that didn't end up in that place. So, right, right. Um, cer- certain, a little bit of luck involved there and. Well, not, and also that there's that still make art though, you know. Well, no, and, and when and the thing I would push back against that too is like I would give a great deal to go back in time and interview either of them before it hit to say like are you really out to change the entire culture? They'd probably be like I'm just trying to get this thing to work. I just want to make this thing. I want to survive. Yeah. I want this to be something that is good art that people enjoy and I make a living wage off it. Um so like the, the the I also get nervous about the mythology that people build around uh, people that they admire. So like when you were talking about like oh I don't I don't know how I feel about being a groupie about somebody, uh, you know it's like I I think that getting excited about other people's ideas is super super cool. <laughs> <laughs> uh, although although I Thank will you. say that like I get nervous about myself in that like 
I think sometimes I could listen to very bad ideas if they're persuasive enough. Like I don't trust myself sometimes. <laughs> like sure. years ago, we years ago we did an episode of um, the Saturday Supercast, another podcast I did, which was about <laughs> cartoons, and we were doing the um, summarizing the cartoon All Stars to the Rescue cartoon. Do you remember this? I don't know if I is it was it like a bunch of different characters from different cartoons? Maybe I'm yes. of something else. Is that trying trying to? Yeah, it was it was it was like Michelangelo from the Ninja Turtles, Garfield, Bugs Bunny, okay, uh, yeah. Alf, and all these other '80s and early '90s cartoon characters banding together to stop these kids from doing drugs. Doing drugs, and yeah. I, and I watched it in order to prepare for the show, and I'm like, this would have worked like such a tonic on my little brain. I was so ready to sign up to be a good boy for all my favorite heroes that like like yeah. they could have probably. And I'm like, what would have happened if the wrong people made that thing, right? Like, what would have sure. happened if somebody would have said, <laughs> right? And I'm like, I don't know. Uh, and, well, and for that for reason, sure that is happening and has happened that a lot of people with bad intentions have used the same tools to get kids to think and want all sorts of unhealthy things. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. So, 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 but so like, I, I understand like the, the reluctance of like not wanting to like, well, I, I don't want to be a total groupie of anybody. I don't want to have my head totally up somebody else's uh, back end about, about ideas. But um, how did we get there? How did, what were we talking about before that? Um, oh, before this, all I, um, I, there was a discussion about idioms. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, it was it was about the mythology around highly oh, successful sure. people, right? And like yeah, and yeah. like the the sort of retrospective, like, well, I just did such and such. Well, you know, it's um, it's it's worth questioning. Are are we looking at what they've accomplished, or are we looking at what the art is? And yeah. what is it that you're really after? It, it, there's nothing wrong to say that I want to make art to be wealthy. That's perfectly reasonable if that's what, if that's what brings you like really uh, complete satisfaction. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think that's a question worth answering honestly. Yeah, sure. And you got to kind of be uh, open to the consequences, you know. So it's like the magic mirror like, gate. What's the magic mirror gate? From the Neverending Story. Okay, explain, explain, because I mean, uh, you, the, you, have, you have me sold a never-ending story, but <laughs> explain well, how this I know you, Yeah, you. well, you. I know you have a relationship with this story, um, but this is an, and I've not read the book, but I've seen the movie, and this this okay. moment in the film haunted me as a child, and yeah. uh, it's the part where Atreyu goes to the magic mirror gate. Now, in the movie, oh, it's just like I think, where this, I think I know where this is going, and it's giving me chills, because it's something <laughs> yeah, like, I remember, but I've never understood, but I'm suddenly like getting... A feeling for it that I don't think I've ever appreciated. So you, well, I'm just excited. We'll we'll see if I if I have like a real philosophical okay. insight or if I just have like an incredible hang up that I need to get over, uh, yeah. which could be either, could be both. Uh, but so the, the Atreyu goes to the Sphinx first, yes. right? And the yes. Sphinx is you have to walk through without fear, you know. Mm -hmm. And like if you don't, the eyes open and it incinerates you from the inside, like it does that night that he sees on the ground, yeah. right? That's yeah. that's concrete. That's scary, that's intense, and it feels like that is a real achievement when he gets past the Sphinx. Yeah. But then the little old man says, oh, no, now he's got to do the magic mirror gate. And they're like, what's the big deal with that? Because like, Falcor is always like, it'll be fine. What's, gonna, what's the worst that can happen? And he yeah. says, uh, you don't understand anything. Uh, men approach this thing, and kind men discover that they are cruel. Brave men discover they're Ooh. really cowards. Confronted with your true self, most men run away screaming. Right, and I've got chills right now. And, and that's <laughs> like, yeah, that's what it did to me. It's like a like a ten year old. I'm like, wait, 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 wait. There's like a real me that I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and if I ever see that guy, I might not be cool with what I see. Uh, that is frightening, you know. Yeah. Uh, so it's like it's like ask yourself what you want from your art is kind of like approaching that gate. Right. And like, yeah, oh, is this good? And I mean, and I had a conversation with a therapist and I brought that very idea up as I said, you know, I was like, what if I find mm -hmm. out that I'm, I'm not as loving as I think, what if I'm really after this because I'm craving love and I'm, I'm feeling incomplete and I'm chasing after something and I'm actually like, like, like Gollum in the Lord of the Rings and I'm not yeah. like a brave little boy. And she looked at me, she said, could be, yeah. <laughs> you know, that's, that's like, the thing. <laughs> That touches on a theme that's been very important for me for the last few years, um, which is, it's really cool, cool that you bring that up. But yeah, that's kind of the point is like, if you look in the mirror, a lot of us anticipating that it's, hor it's terrifying. It's terrifying. The thought of yeah. looking in the mirror and seeing something you don't want to see. But, yeah. um, I think the more common, the more common, um, 
like uh, response or what more commonly happens is you look in the mirror. When you finally do get the courage to look in the mirror, you do see things that you don't like seeing. But that's like, yeah. that's the beginning of, of a certain type of spiritual growth. You know, when you yeah. see like, oh, look at, look at this. And when you can kind of be accepting and loving of, of this thing that you didn't want to look at. And then it's like, you know, you, you have so much, so much less fear and of, of what can come in life. Um, I don't know if, if, have I geeked out with you over like, um, wizard of earth sea yet? Have, have we I don't about think so. Before? And I've not read this. So I, I'm, I'm curious about what you're going to get me excited about okay. reading. <laughs> uh, I absolutely recommend it. So this is, I read it for the, I've just had this feeling for years that I needed to read this book. It's, it's one of these things that's kind of almost woo woo and, 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 and eerie. Um, I read another Ursula Le Guin book that I like, I liked, but then I, I just kind of felt like I needed to read this book and I read it. Oh, I'm trying to put my finger on it. I think, um, end of, end of 2018, end of 2018, going through a difficult time, um, when I read it, but it was one of these things that the second I picked it up, I opened the, the page. I was like hooked the first wow. page just has this like really poetic kind of slow, um, really beautiful pacing to it. And okay, I don't want to like describe the whole book, uh, like point by point. So I'm going to try to figure out a good way to to set it up. Um, but anyway, I I liked it so much. I read the book. I know it's it's like one of the first books I've ever like. I finished it and I immediately picked it up and read it through from beginning to end. Wow! End. Like it just it was one of these things that every single section of it, I'm like this means something like I was like, there's a message here. I need to understand this message. Oh, man. And there's certain, certain sections that were just like completely in, like intoxicating to me and I had to go back and like, I need to read the skin cause I need to understand this. <laughs> um, and I kind of, I kind of don't want to spoil it for you cause I feel like kind of making the point I want to make is going to spoil it, spoil it for you. But the fact that we're having the discussion in this context, when you read the book, you're probably going to get a sense of how it's going to resolve and what's going to happen. So my apologies. Mm, no problem you know, if, if, and when you do, but it's very much about, so I'm sorry, I'm going to have to spoil it to explain, (laughs) explain the principle, but it's very much about this, um, this powerful, uh, talented young sorcerer who, um, unleashes this horrific shadow into the, in this world. He tries to do this spell that's kind of just due to his, his ego and his ambition and arrogance he does this spell that's more powerful than he's really ready for. And he unleashes a shadow into this world that disfigures him and then kind of disappears. And then, but his, his uh, mentors kind of tell him like, okay, this thing's going to come back and we don't really know what it is or how to stop it. And, and kind of within the mythology of wizard of earth sea is as a wizard, you gain power over things by knowing their true. Uh, name. Everyone has like a common yeah. name. And then everything has like has a true name. And so part of what he's practicing is you have to learn the true name of all these things to have power. Yeah. Over them. So part of his adventures as he goes out is he, he like figures out true names and he has power over things. But all these wizards and these are like the most powerful wizards in the world that are his mentors. They're like, we don't know this thing's name. This is this thing we've heard about. There's some stories about it, but no one knows its name. And um, because because and because so, this the evil you face is is the, is uh, is unique to the world because you're unique to the world right because you're unique yeah. to the world. yeah because he, he he brought it into existence and you can already kind of see where yeah. it's going but there's this just kind of horrifying first arc where he's just running from this thing he can't figure out how to escape it there's this point where it corners him and it, it's possessed someone else's body and it knows his name and he loses all his power as this thing's just chasing him in this like this desolate oh winter, my gosh winter um like setting but anyway, this, the, the turn in the book is when he kind of returns to his master. Uh-huh. He had this master that was teaching him before he kind of got like arrogant and ambitions, this ambitious and his master kind of takes him in and consoles him. And he's like, he's more humble now and he leaves to go. And he finally makes this turn where he's like, okay, I, I can't run from this thing. I have to go chase it. I'm going to, I'm going to, if I have to grab it and drag it to the bottom of the ocean, I'm going to do that. But I have to chase this thing down and defeat mm-hmm. it, you know? Um, and he has this thing, he says, he writes on the door as he leaves his master and it says, master, I go hunting. Mm. And when I read that, I was just like, it was like how you I felt when you t- told that story with the tray, just like, yeah, yeah, story. yeah, yeah. Like, yes, <laughs> yes. Um, because that, that's anyway, a person who's fully engaged with their experience and their, their journey. Right. Yeah. Yeah, you, exactly. He's finally saying, I'm, I'm going to face this thing. And eventually 
you can kind of guess what's going to happen, but he, he, he tracks this thing down. He chases it down. He has some help with some friends, but finally at the ends of the world, he finds this thing and he's like in this ocean and the ocean kind of turns to ground and he approaches this monstrous shadow and it's distorting and contorting and becoming all these horrible things. And then at the last moment, he like, he names it with his yeah, own name. Like yeah. he realizes that the shadow is himself. Oh, so and once he does that, then he becomes, and in the book, she, I think she uses the word, like he becomes an integrated whole yeah. person. He accepts that as, 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 as part of who he is. So that, that's the, so, that's the dark um, crystal, but with, with go, him yeah. as the, uh, the disintegrated too, instead of an outside hero uniting him, he unites himself. That's great. Oh, exactly. Yeah, it's, it's very, um, very similar. Go ahead. Two thoughts. Two thoughts. One, um, one. I am so grateful that I can have these conversations with you, Brandon, because <laughs> I, I mean, and I'm going to admit something here. I get really insecure sometimes talking about this stuff in mixed company because I've had too many conversations throughout my life where somebody's looked at me and said like. We you just stop worshiping Joseph Campbell and be a human being? You know, <laughs> it's like not not everything can be contextualized into story. I'm like, well, can't it? <laughs> yeah, it kind, of, it kind of all is actually. You know, <laughs> it, it that's how it looks through my eyes, and I know that sometimes I can be a real bore around certain people who don't think about this in that way. You know, and I'm not mm-hmm. I'm not trying to like di- di- differentiate into like, well, there's the good people and the bad people, the smart people and dumb people. It's more like I don't expect everybody to care about this as much as I do, but it's always refreshing to like be able to lower my guard and just like roll with it and like be able to like enjoy talking about this stuff in this great detail. But the second thought I, I get it to is when you started talking about spiritual journey is something I noticed that I started to have a different relationship with was the entire concept of sin. Hmm. And this idea that when I was a child and I was thinking about this, like I, I realized that I had up until very recently a very, I would define a childish relationship with that whole concept of what sin is. And because when I was a kid, as a kid, I remember thinking like, if I do bad, even if I apologize, even if I do some kind of remediation, there's no taking away the fact that I did bad. It is a permanent mark on who I am as a person. And so yeah. the, the goal is to do no bad. Don't do bad. Because if you do, it's always going to follow you, you know? Yeah. Uh, and then when I realized that, like, wait a second, this is, again, very recently, um, this idea that acknowledgement of sin is not a mark of guilt, but it's an acknowledgement of your failings and, and acknowledging a commitment to constantly contend with them. Contend with, not necessarily overcome, because we're only so good, right? If, if yeah. you want to go by Christian mythology, we're fallen creatures and so on. Which, again, I, I as a child, I resented that. I'm like, why are you telling me that I'm stained automatically? That's that You're a jerk for saying that, you know? But yeah. you don't know me, you know? But, like, as, an, <laughs> as I get older, I'm like, oh, wait, you know, I, I am... There, there's like a certain kind of corruption that comes out of being a creature that exists in a world where life lives on life, right? Like yeah, there's there's sure. a certain existential crisis that comes out of that, an existential dread when you realize what you're really up against. And to say like, well, I'm going to fall and I'm going to fall a lot and I'm going to forgive myself and recommit myself to keep engaging with it. And then then it, it may realize, oh, wait a minute, this is very similar to this whole idea of Buddhism and Taoism and it's just like accepting of the way things are, right? And when exactly. I realized that like, the acknowledgement of sin is the acceptance of who we really are. Looking in that mirror, that's saying good. like, "Yep, that, that that's that." There's some nasty boils on that thing, <laughs> and I'm going to, I'm going to love it for what it is, as it is in this moment. I'm going to allow it to be what it is in this moment, and I'm going to commit to keep trying. Um, I like that. I mean, that's, <laughs> I, I, I mean, the thing I hadn't really realized till you talked about that is just this idea that. Um, like with it, within the idea of sin, at the very least, is recognition that something's going on. That as as they would say in Buddhist Buddhist language, they they like to use the much more gentle uh, phrasing that it's unskillful action. You know. Oh, I love that so much. Yeah, so, the, the the sin of inadvertence, right? Yeah. The, oh gosh, that that is the, such a more nuanced way of thinking about it. Yeah. The, the, there's things we we suffer. And we want to escape from our suffering. And we do it in unskillful ways and we, or we can do it in skillful ways, you know, Yeah. Um, which I, I like thinking about it in that way. Um, but isn't it so interesting? I feel that like, this is something that I've, I've been aware of more recently getting back to like the shadow thing that there's all of these, I've been coming aware of like becoming aware of all these, um, like different beliefs and attitudes that were imprinted in me very, very long time ago. 
and you think you're mm-hmm. growing up and you're maturing and you're seeing things a different way. And then you have these moments where you realize I still have this way of looking at things that I developed yeah. when I was like 12, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. That still fundamentally Very flames how I look at like a, a broad, um, segment of things. Um, like I kind of had this, so going back to like wizard of Earthsea, when I first read it, there's kind of this idea of like embracing the shadow. That's there's kind of like a, a macho way of thinking of embracing the shadow where you're like, I'm yeah. going to embrace this part of myself. That's kind of monstrous, but kind of cool, you know, and yeah. I can, I yeah. can, I can be strong when I need to and, and, and beat bad guys by being a worse bad guy type of type of embracing the shadow. But I just over and over again, I've had these experience where that those moments in the book have been recontextualized and where I realize like I've had these moments, um, you know, mostly doing like meditative work where I'm like, wait a second, the shadow is also this frightened, vulnerable little child that I don't want to acknowledge exists, you know, that wants other people yeah. to like me. And that's the shadow too, you know, and you got to like embrace yeah. that thing that's, that you might be ashamed of embracing as much as the stuff that's kind of feels cool to embrace, you know? <laughs> Right, right. Yeah, it's yeah, it's funny. I think about like the 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 few times I've ever engaged in like physical harm, like like trying to harm another person. And it, there haven't been many. And and they, most of them were when I was a kid. And I remember I have a very clear memory of the time I punched a kid in the face and I felt my Jeez. bone hit his bone and yeah. I did not hurt him, Brandon, because <laughs> I was a skinny little kid. He was bigger than me. I I I, I thought I was being Michael J. Fox in Back to the Future. Um but like it just the the thought that I could even do that was so frightening to me. It was so intensely frightening that like oh I could hurt another person and uh, um and I know what it's like to be hurt and I just did that to somebody else and I did it on purpose. Um, it was such an ugly and terrifying feeling and like I, when I, so my relationship with the shadow has very rarely been like oh it makes me cool. Like there's been a couple <laughs> times where I thought I was being cool when I was being aggressive to somebody, but most of the time I get absolutely consumed with fear and and like real fear when I, when those kinds of uh, thoughts and feelings uh, happen to me. So yeah, I can very much identify with this idea of like the shadow as being this frightened child who's just like reacting, not being proactive. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And that's just like sums up so much, so much of life. Um, So (laughs) (laughs) uh, I feel like I'm just, just barely kind of starting to get out of that. Um, anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. Me too. It, it, it's this, this last couple of years. I mean, like, so I just, what, I'm in my mid forties now and th- there was like, uh, I don't want to like, you know, be a total cliche and be like, Oh, you start to care about so much less in your forties, but you do. <laughs> and, it's, and it's really great. Like you just start letting go of like so many different things. And, and like, I went through like one year of being really angry because mm-hmm. I was like, okay, I'm 40 now. And what do I got to show for it? I went through that whole business and then I got angry at myself for getting angry about it. Sure. So like, Hey, come on, you're better than this Jersey. <laughs> you're, t- you're too smart to have a midlife crisis. I'm oh, like, no, man. but <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the thing too. Yeah. So I just, I'm 42 now and it's just kind of realizing that midlife crises are a real thing. You know, I totally <laughs> experienced one and I had this feeling of like, yeah. man, I heard forties are supposed to be like, everyone's supposed to chill out at 40. Why am I not chilling out? Why am I so angry? You know, why am I like silently yeah, yelling in the yeah. shower? You know? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not laughing at you. I'm laughing from <laughs> no, the pain of it. <laughs> But this is, finding that there is something on the other end, you know, like feeling yeah. like I did, I did kind of pass through that and on the other end being like, oh yeah, you know what? And you know, it's, that's where I am right now. And so I'm not going to be naive and think that I've got things figured out. Um, no, like that's the best part. It's like suddenly I came yeah. up to the side and I was like, oh, I don't know everything. And that is kind of awesome because that means I've got so much more to do. You know, yeah. uh, I think part of the crisis for me came out of the fact that like, uh, and I had this, a lot of conversations with my wife Anne about this is like, we had only figured out our life up to that point. You know, it's like, okay, then, yeah. then we'll be 40 and then we'll just be on cruise control and just being like really, really skillful for the rest of our lives, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and like hitting that and going through that, 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 whatever that was and coming out the other side going like, oh man, you know what? I actually, I know very, very little. <laughs> And yeah. and that that is kind of exciting because now that means like every moment is a teachable moment. 
Um, and it, it was after I turned 40 that I, I changed my, so I teach, for those who don't know who I am, I, I teach comic book classes as well as make comic books. Um, and one of the things I started doing after that whole crisis happened is the first day of class, I have the kids, kids sit on the floor, crisscross applesauce in a semicircle. And I sit and I face all of them and I say like, okay, well, well, actually I, before I'd have them do that, I, I show a bunch of slides on the screen of me with other famous cartoonists, right? I'm like, here's me with Randa uh-huh. Tuggemeyer. Here's me with Dan Santat, blah, blah, blah. The kids are all going, oh my gosh, you know these people? I'm like, yeah, you know what that means? That means the comic book world is very small. And that means we all know each other. And that means if you're a jerk, word gets out fast. So now everybody <laughs> out of your seats. And we have them sit in a semicircle. And I go like, we're about to enter into a pact. You know, We're about to become cartoonists together. And cartoonists behave in certain ways. There's certain codes of conduct that if you don't mm-hmm. abide by these, then you know, you're out of the pack. And I say, like, one, we build each other up. We don't, uh, we don't tear each other down. And like, two, and this is the important one, is like, it is awesome to not know something. If you don't know something, that means that you can learn a new thing. You have more skills to acquire. You have more power-ups to achieve. So if you don't know something, you ask. And then I said, three, if someone asks for help you, and you have the help, you offer it. Like, and then I look them all in the eye. I'm like, does anybody have a problem with this? And I let the moment sit, right? <laughs> and I say, if you've got a problem with this, there's the door. You can wait for your parents to pick you up. But if you're okay with this, then we're in this together. We're going to be cartoonists, you know? And like, like every year, there's at least one kid after this is over. He's like, oh my God, that was intense. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I just like, I want to imagine that it's like in some movie where there's actually going to be two or three kids that actually walk out the door. Right, right. <laughs> Well, it, and it, oh, there's always going to be a kid who just like sits there and like, I don't know what this is all about. I don't care. And then like they get a little obstreperous later on. And then I go, well, you know, you made a, you made an Remember? agreement. Yeah, you said you didn't you didn't speak out. Next time, speak out. Otherwise, you, you're, you're abiding by the rules, you know. Yeah. But but well, also going back to this, this shadow thing, another thing you made me think of is that line at the end of The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe where Lucy's talking about Aslan and she says like, well, he is a lion, but he is good, you know. Yeah. And I, and I think about that a lot, like this idea of, because like something else that's happened in my recent years as a teacher is I've allowed myself to be a little dangerous in the room with the kids. Um, mm-hmm. Not dangerous in the sense of I'm endangering them, but like being yeah. an unpredictable presence. My, the, the treasure of my regard has a price and the price is mm. your uh, acknowledgement of the rules and code of conduct of the room, Right. And while I'm not going to like punish a child, like, you know, what, what do they call that when they used to paddle kids in class? Um, not I don't corp- know. Paddle? Corp- <laughs> cor- corporal punishment, something like that. Uh, I'm not going to do anything yeah. like that. But, but, you know, it's like I make it clear to them that like, you know, m- my cheerfulness and the, 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 the resilience and uh, boundlessness of my affection and support has limits. And if you break any like severe rules, there's going to be consequences. And, I, and I've even said to them in that case, you know, it's like yeah, there was one kid, he really, he crossed the line. I was like, okay, you're waiting out in the hall. You're waiting for your parents to get here. Guess what? Your parents are on the way, you know? And the rest of the yeah. kids were like terrified because they'd never seen me, you know, actually enforce a rule like explicitly like that yeah i i don't know i think i might have mentioned this to you before but i i find that to be really the case with my son i don't know what it is in particular about my son Mm. but i feel like he really appreciates and respects um when i like have have boundaries and he's very much he is very much like programmed to be the alpha male like he is little Mm. oedipus he wants to be in charge you know (laughs) he wants to like you know, he's like very literally like, I want to be the one that cuddles with mom and he will come in and give orders. Like he'll come in and give orders. This is what we're doing. Here's how we're, here's what we're going to do. I don't want to do this. I do want to do this. Um, and I've just kind of found that like, he appreciates me creating boundaries for him, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. but you you look at Aslan and it's really kind of the same as as Superman. And you know, we both love to geek out about archetypes but yeah, yeah. You know, the archetype is, is really simple archetype. It's just someone that's strong and good, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so it's like it, anyone, it, anyone can, can be, can find being a monster appealing. It's, Ooh, I want to be a monster. Like, cause I'm powerful. Yeah. But yeah. when you think about who you want to be your friend, you don't want a monster to be your friend. You want right. Superman or Aslan to be your friend because they're strong and they're good, you know? Yeah, but but, but, but people want to be that too. 
Yeah. What what I find super appealing about that too, and I know we've talked about this a lot, and this is what I was trying to put into that comic I did, Boulder and Fleet, is like this idea that they're always operating with such incredible restraint that we are, there's no conception for the amount of the, the, the lightness of touch that they're enacting upon the world, right? And mm-hmm. what I like about that is not the fantasy of power, it's the 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 modeling of having that sophistication to be able to know just enough energy to push into the room to get the results that you want, right? Yeah. Versus, because like another thing that I find, I, I find very lately very tiresome is the mythology of the captain of industry, the Steve Jobs, telling people how it is and you don't even know what you want yet, but I have a vision and I'm going to impress it upon you and then you're going to thank me for it, right? Um, yeah. There's something I find like deeply upsetting about that idea as, as the, 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 the more I contend with it. And there's something very, oh my gosh, it's just so alluring about somebody who knows just enough energy to push. Well, I guess this comes from Taoism, is this idea of like, uh, if you did your job right, nobody's sure that anything was done at all, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think that's that's a much more difficult idea to wrap your brain around. I think characters like Superman and Aslan sort of like very concretely and visually represent what that's about, which is why I love the Christopher Reeve Superman because like when he flies, he just like sort of pushes himself lightly off the ground and then he's off (laughs) versus the Henry Cavill Superman who does like this thing where he's building up all this power and then explodes into the sky. And I see that. I'm like, that looks neat. Doesn't feel like Superman to me. (laughs) Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, I can definitely relate that to some of the things I've been I've been practicing with lately where it's like, OK, what's the, what's the minimum amount of energy necessary? You know, this is kind of one of the things that's very nice about like the practice of meditation yeah. is finding that balance of um, energy and um, relaxation, you know, where it's it's something you're constantly practicing where it's like you want the minimum amount of energy to be able to stay focused and alert but not yeah. so much that you get re- restless and antsy and bored. And at the same time, you don't want to be so so relaxed and so comfortable that you get totally spacey and gone and try and find that that area, that like fine balance where you can stay energetic and, and move. To, and, it, and it's something that applies to a lot of other areas of life. Um, and that was something that I felt like really preceded my, um, my midlife crisis was this real imbalance of just like everything I was doing, I was putting on the gas way too much you know <laughs> it's just like <laughs> that's a good metaphor that's a really good metaphor <laughs> it's like emotionally it's just like i'm pouring so much into every action that yeah. i'm doing emotionally and kind of realizing like dude like you don't need to put so much emotion and so much like tension and pressure and anxiety into every action you know and finding a way to kind of like turn down that dial um, can, can i can i tell you a story that, that i've happened. Can I tell you a story I've never told anybody else uh, publicly? Please so do. Be, okay. Yeah. So, um, so a characteristic of my upbringing, um, part of the environment that I grew up with was you showed you cared by being upset about it. And hmm. the louder you were, the louder you expressed your negative emotions about something was a status symbol of how much you care about the thing. And so if you were if you were level headed, if you maintained your emotions or if you if you managed your emotions in any way, that was tantamount to punching out and saying, like, I, I'm not a part of this at all. Um, yeah. So and I think when in that definitely colored my younger years as an artist was me showing up like I have to show I care. And if I if I care, everybody's got to hear it on, you know, full blast uh, level 11 on the on the speaker. Otherwise, they're not going to know, you know. Uh, and, and I think, I, I know I still contend, I still wrestle with that sometimes because like I'll, um, like most, I would say 99% of the time when I'm being like really effusive in my joy, it's like, it's coming from a real place. But sometimes I, I can feel that coming from this place of, I better show I care. Otherwise somebody's gonna say I don't. Yeah. Um, but I feel like that, that, that it, I, I don't know if that resonates with any other people starting out in art or any people who have an experience a journey through art. But I think that that was certainly a um, a motivating factor in how I expressed myself as an artist early on was like really proving that I had a place there. I got, I got to shout it out that I really, really want this, uh, that I really want to be a part of this community and I really care about this community. You know? Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's tricky to work with. And that's always, 
in my kind of approach to making art, I feel like it's always been like, I got to swing for the fences, which mm-hmm. has always been tough, uh, professionally. And, um, maybe mine's motivated a little bit different. It's more like kind of middle child screaming for attention type thing. Where oh, I feel like I just yeah. have to be loud enough to, to get attention, you know, yeah. like I'm as, as you've experienced, I'm kind of the type of guy that's like, um, doesn't speak much in uh with small talk but as soon as like if you give me an opening like i'm not going to shut up for the next like five hours (laughs) you know yeah so um (laughs) but (laughs) not sure where i was going with that but um well, swinging for the fences and like really establishing yourself yeah. in the room, kind of thing. Yeah, but that's still is that's uh, so like as as professionally, that's that was always a trick because there's other artists that were like, I'm going to deliver exactly what the client wants. You know, mm-hmm. I'm I can do it and I can make it very polished. And my thing was always like, I'm going to deliver something that no one's thinking about, that no one's even going to like think about. Like I'm always going to yeah. try to do something that's so far out there, that's going to catch everyone by surprise. You know. Um, but it's like, it is that kind of thing. Like I really want to get attention. I want to like stand out and it was really far. And sometimes it actually, it's like some of the stuff I've created in that vein. That's, that's kind of the way I work, you know? Um, and there's, there's like, there, there's this funny thing that happens where you kind of start realizing that your motivations are not all one thing or all the other. Right. Right. You know? And it's like, Oh, why did I decide to become an artist? I, part of it is like, there is vulnerabilities and insecurities that made me feel like I, I, this is the only thing I can do well. And there's like, uh, you know, delusions of grandeur that, that motivated it, but there's other things as well mixed in with that for sure. You know? And so sometimes it's like swinging for the fences is about wanting to be heard and, and, you know, wanting people to respect me, but I don't know there, maybe there's something inside of that, um, making noise. That's also like a, it's a really positive, loving type of noise that you're trying to make. I don't know. No, no I, I, th- I think you're absolutely right that like to sum it up as being like some kind of like, well, a childhood trauma or a childhood upbringing like makes it that I just do this thing or like a puppet. I just I'm just being triggered and reacting to this thing all the time, I think is an oversimplification as well. Right. Because I, I could easily mm. make the argument that um, my. The, you know, the, the, this thing that I experienced as a young person that uh, that I can detect as an adult is like, okay, this is me just like screaming I care because otherwise people are going to say I don't care. That's not the whole of it because part of it is I do care. And because I've become very articulate at explaining why I care about something, that's provided me with enormous uh, self-reflection and, and, and skill sets for like um, – uh, organizational work like so I do work with nonprofit organizations to create comics festivals right and like a skill that I've developed yeah. as a result of having to be very articulate about how I care about something means that I can have a really thoughtful conversation with a group of people saying like let's define success criteria and, just, and determine why we want to do the thing that we want to do because why do we care about this thing right so to yeah. the, these kinds of things uh the, being a middle child and wanting to, to, to get that attention can, yes, it could be a negative um, motivator, but it can also lead to like skills that develop super powerful, positive motivation and, and results in the form of, yeah, like you think about illustration in ways that always surprise me. Like when you were doing Sketchbook mm-hmm. Summer and watching your Sketchbook Summer entries, um, it was it was almost like looking like art made by an alien, right? <laughs> like it's like, I, and I don't mean that in a, in a pejorative way. I mean, I, I mean like I'm looking, I'm going like, how is he thinking about this that he's getting where he's getting right? Yeah. Like looking at the process behind it, I can see you're thinking about shape in a way that is utterly inaccessible to me right now. So well, things like that. Well, thanks. You know, it's, what's interesting. You bring that up and I think this is kind of related, but I guess one thing I have to kind of admit, and this goes back to like, idioms and dogmas and stuff like that is um one of the things i've kind of accepted is this is maybe more lately but i just like have not had a desire to do to draw lately (laughs) if that like makes any sense at all but i feel like i have had this pressure on myself for decades that like if i wanted to be an artist i have to be drawing all the time and it got to the point where it was just like and even geez i even like created like sketchbook summer as an expression of that you know, it's like draw all the time. Yeah. We yeah. can do this thing where we draw all the time. Yeah. And doing that was like totally build a totally sketchbook exhausting. in a month. Yeah. Um, and I've just been in this phase for quite a while where I've, I haven't been doing any art and then kind of getting to this point where I'm finally like, 
okay, I'm okay with that. I'm okay that I'm more interested mm. in, in doing other things right now, you know, and it's, it's still something I can do. And I'm at, I'm at a point where like, I'm very confident in what I can do as an artist. So, um, but I don't know. I, I was talking with another artist about that and he was like, well, don't you like, aren't you like sketching all the time? And I was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, he was like flabbergasted. He was like, what? You don't like sketch all the, you don't have a sketchbook. You don't sketch all the time. Um, so I'm not sure what, like what to make of that or, or where to go with that. You know, it's like, I'm, I'm very much in this, this place, uh, professionally and personally where I, I really don't know what the future is going to hold for me professionally and, and what direction I'm going to go in. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but like for the time being, I'm just kind of like, yeah, I like next time I pick up the pencil, I want to pick up a pencil because like, I want to pick up a pencil. I don't want to do it because I feel like this is something I should be doing. You know, you, you want to go hunting. Right. Like you don't want, what does that mean? Well, that's going back to Earthsea when you said I'm, I'm, I'm off hunting. I'm going and oh, engaging yeah. with the world in a very <laughs> deliberate way. Um, rather than a perfunctory yeah. way. Well, dad says I, I should do this. So I guess I better go do it. Right. Versus I no, I'm going to, yeah. I'm going to go act upon the world. Um, yeah, it's, it's funny you're bringing this up. Cause like I just finished a, um, comic story for that captain seriously project that I do. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, the it, the short version is it's it's a comic that is created for a specific school district where in during which I work with the school administration to create action adventure stories that also deal with some kind of issues that particular group of kids in that particular grade are dealing with. And so I was doing the tenth grade book, and they they said like we're having a problem with kids being in cliques and being very tribal about their cliques. I'm like okay, so a story about tribalism. I could I certainly have feelings about that, and I have a lot of experience with it from my own high school years, and. The, the, the fulcrum point of the story, the part, the part where everything changes is when one of the kids says to another kid, you're one of us now. You don't need to attend to that anymore. And he says, I am one of you, but that's not all I am. And then like that sets off like a cascading of changes in the story where everybody suddenly sees things differently because it's like he's the one who said aloud, you can't, we can't box each other up in these identities like this. It's, it, it, it has its utility, but it, it's not like, it's not a long-term fruitful uh, uh, prospect. Um, and I was thinking when you were talking about not having like the desire to draw it, like I was thinking like, ooh, 2010 Jersey would be so angry with him right now. <laughs> <laughs> like, what are you? A, are you a cartoonist or not? Here's the line, my friend. Yeah. You cross it or don't, but just don't darken my door with your not drawing sketchbook. You know, <laughs> but like, yeah. <laughs> but like the, the as I think about it now, I'm like, no, that sounds like, OK, two things. One okay, you've done enough skill acquisition, Brandon, that like your brain is doing something right now, right? And you've done, yeah. you've done enough meditation that you also know that your brain is doing something, right? Something's yeah. happening and you're letting it happen. And then two, I think that there's another kind of, like there's a nobility to monastic pursuit of a thing. There's another, there's also a mm-hmm. next level kind of like uh, black belt or green lightsaber nobility too. Like, but when I do it, <laughs> Right, it's like it's like the idea of like the samurai doesn't take the sword out of the sheath unless it's actually going to get used, right? Sure, yeah. That's where I feel I'm, I'm at. Like the last with the last projects I finished, I feel like I like more confidence to to do a project than I've ever I ever had. Like if anyone were come to me and say like we want to do a comic book, we want it to be about X Y Z. Like I feel like totally confident I could jump in, jump in and, and do that, you know. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, I just. I'm just like kind of interested in other things right now. And, and plus with like the whole way things are right now, I've got like kids, I have to like kind of watch and stuff like that. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Kind of. (laughs) Yeah. You know, I've been surprised it hasn't been noisier while while we've been doing that, doing this, but. Oh, uh, I just, I, I don't have children, but I I have been thinking a lot about all my friends who do have children in the last month and a half um, Mm -hmm. as we've been, you know, shelter in place. And I know that that must be so intense of an adjustment to like continue to be a good parent and try to get any any work done and try to like give structure to these children's lives. Um, that's that's super super hard. I can only imagine how hard that is. Um, and and I got a little bit annoyed with some of my cartooning friends who all went online and were like, "Welcome to my world, uh, working from home." I'm like, "Well." <laughs> Well, childless friend <laughs> who's had 10 years to like work out yeah. their studio and figure out how to work from home. Let's, let's not, let's not make light of this. <laughs> it, 
it's fortunately it's worked out pretty well for for us. I mean, I I'm not working right now. Mm. Um, my wife has a full time job. You know, she's pregnant. We got a baby coming in a couple months, and she's got like very generous new parent, like three months new parent leave when that's done. Wow. So we just feel like we have a lot of room for, and I'm like applying for jobs and looking for freelance and things like that. But I'm pretty comfortable comfortable with. Um, kind of really running interference right now. Mm. Um, so I'm kind of, I'm really the one managing the kids right now. And I try to find time here and there to, to get in, you know, some writing or I do get in some like freelance every once in a while. But, um, I, I mean, there's definitely been tense moments and moments where the kids are driving me crazy. <laughs> and, you know, where I do have those moments where I'm like, Ooh, I, I can see that monster that I'm capable of being. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, <laughs> <laughs> let's not murder our children <laughs> you know? let's not get too greek about this <laughs> yeah. meaning greek mythology for anybody who misunderstood that yeah yeah <laughs> and it's uh it's it's mostly been good like i feel like we have a, a a good number the fact that there's four of us yeah you know my kids are at a good age like we mostly are able to keep each other company more than anything else and and not let things get too like isolated and, and lonely so mm. has not been bad oh good i'm really glad to hear it. i mean are you are you guys pulling your hair out with uh are you guys both able to work and stuff where you're at uh yeah yeah it's it's been it's been it's been an adjustment but it's been good in a lot of ways i feel like we're getting a uh a, a sort of a sneak preview of what retirement will look like um <laughs> oh yeah you kind of mentioned that before yeah <laughs> Um, so it's like, it's like finding ways to be aware of what each other's energy levels are and respond to them in helpful ways. Um, yeah. and you know, it's like, I think I'm feeling like we need to go for a long walk right now. Let's go for a long walk. You know, that kind of thing. Both of us having yeah. the the presence of mind to see that in one another and to calmly address it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's not the easiest thing. I, I mean, in, in our case too, it's like we just moved to Columbus a year ago and we got a, a, a smaller apartment than what we had as far as our house while we searched for a house. So the plan was by this time uh -huh. we'd be out house shopping um, and, and wouldn't be working from home. So, you know, it's like th there was a lot of adjustments to be made, but you know, I mean, we're both adults. It's easy to negotiate with two um you know, adults who profess to love each other. <laughs> so, yeah. And now, yeah. now remind me it's, uh, um, and she's working at like the Billy Wilder. She's a curator there at the museum. So, Is that and, accurate? And got a job at the Billy Ireland cartoon library at and Mu museum. Billy Ireland. Yeah. Okay. As, I don't know who Billy Wilder is. But. <laughs> Uh, but Billy Ireland is a cartoonist from, he worked in the Columbus Dispatch and did a lot of political cartoons and comic strips for a long time. Uh, he's the guy who trained uh, Milton Kniff. So, oh, okay. so they actually, um, it's, it's, I, I, I really hope I could show you this museum sometimes, Brandon, sometime, Brandon, because it's, 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 I'd love to come out and visit. It's, yeah. it's. I, I was not prepared for what that place would do to me the first time I walked in. I mean, because we both grew up in a time when comics was not considered like uh, very high art or literature. Um, and, and I had teachers, art teachers, like trying to dissuade me from doing it. You know, it's like, well, that's not a real job. You should mm -hmm. go into like commercial art, I guess, if you want to do that drawing stuff. Um, yeah. But so then you walk into this marble building where there's like the Will Eisner seminar room, the Charles and Jeannie Schultz, uh, wow. you know, uh, lecture hall. And it's like this giant marble building that says, like, uh, this is a place where the act and art of cartooning are cherished and celebrated things. And I think this is what precipitated some of my thinking about religion recently. Because when I walked in, I like I said, like, oh, I get how people feel about churches and cathedrals now. I get it. Like this, it, yeah. it, it, it affected <laughs> me, you know, like I felt small, but in the right way. Right. Um, yeah. I felt tiny, but part of a giant thing. And that was such a profoundly comforting thing to like have like almost a lifetime of sort of um, uh, inarticulate self-loathing about my life choices in terms of, well, oh, nobody. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Dude. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think that's, and that gets to something that's super important that I think that we miss as we become more secular has mm -hmm. been um, the sanctifying of of work and 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 place. Yeah. So one thing one thing is I was reading about I was reading some stories of people that that go like to Burma to meditate, 
and they go to these like meditation centers. And so while Westerners are there meditating, people from the community will come and bring them food. And they like give them this like honor and respect for like, oh, you are doing the sacred work, the sacred oh, wow. contemplative work. Wow. Um, and it also reminds me, it brings me back to when I was a Mormon missionary. And as a Mormon missionary, you go out and you do this work and you, you put on this suit and cer- suit and certain, sorry, certain suit <laughs> with a shirt and tie. There's yep. this kind of formality and this decorum to it. And the way people treat you, they, tr- they like, Oh, the work you're doing is sacred. Even though you're stepping outside of, you're not making money. You're doing this work. That's this pretty like boring, tedious work. Um, but it's just, there's this space within the culture to say like this work is sacred, you know, mm-hmm. and it can happen with places, but I've been thinking a lot about that lately, like what it might look like if there was a place in our culture where it was like, oh, you decided you wanted to step outside of, of this whole rat race of making money and you want to step outside of that and, and dedicate some time to making art and mm-hmm. that how different it would be if we looked at people that decided to make art with as this like sacred thing. And, you know, to make that work though, artists, also need to like, I think there's, there's also needs to be a trade off there to Mm -hmm. be like, okay, well, if, if if you're going to give me that kind of like deference and you're going to treat this like a sacred thing, then I probably need to act in a way that's, that's a little bit sacred too, you know? That's Um, exactly right. Like you, you can't engage in a sacred act with a sense of hubris or pride or self-aggrandizement that, that that's antithetical yeah. to the whole idea of yeah. what sacredness means sacred baked into the whole concept is a sense of humility and interconnectedness and interdependence we need each other yeah you know and this idea that like okay if i'm gonna if i'm gonna step away and make art i have to maybe accept that it isn't going to be a commercial venture you know maybe that's part of mm-hmm. it and maybe i really am interested in this idea of renunciation lately they like mm-hmm. okay you decide to go be a monk you're going to give up some certain uh, material comforts and, and maybe we can flip that thing. There's this idea of, of being like a starving artist. That's kind of this like contemptuous idea, like mm-hmm. the sad idea of this person freezing in some <laughs> tenement, you know, in some city. Um, and we can flip that and turn that into being something more like, Oh, it's like being a, a, a renunciate where it's like, okay, for this period of time that I decide to create art, I'm going to give up some material comforts um, yeah, to kind of the, demonstrate the, my dedication to this thing, you know? The yogi who goes into the woods kind of thing, right? Yeah. I, I've done my material so pursuits. I've raised my family. Now it's time to go meditate and contemplate. Sure. Instead of being like a bum, some bum like freezing mm-hmm. in a rat infested, you know, apartment, you could, it's more of like, okay, I'm going to be a, it's more of like a, a sacred thing, you know? Anyway. That's an interesting yeah. idea. You just talking about walking into the museum. I'm just yeah. like, just think about how that transforms the way you think about the work you do when you go into a place and it's treated, um, you know, in a, in a, in a different way and it's treated with some sort of honor and, um, deference, you know? Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, and that was, um, throughout my entire life. I, I think this is probably like, uh, analogous to any form of art. Um, but, it was particular to comics in that the the ultimate, even the most successful people were largely unknown or were kind of sneered at by the general public. Like I remember yeah. uh, like a, a 2020 piece on Stan Lee back in like the early 80s. And it was like very tongue in cheek. It was very like, well, is this guy for real or what? You know, <laughs> it, 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 it had that kind of, t- and I remember even as like a, like a 10 year old, I'm like, hey, come on, don't mock the man. He's making things that make my life make more meaningful. You know, it's like, yeah. um, but I was so I I never realized how conditioned I was by that reaction to my choices and and the isolation that that caused for me to where where it, it had utility because there were there were moments where I would engage with people who had like really almost well I would say outright insulting views on what I actually did for a living like sure. they, they yeah and and they would say like. Un- unwittingly say very insulting things to me and I would roll with it and I would bring them around to say, well, I could see how you'd get there, but you know, here's some things to think about. And then they would be like, oh, okay, I guess it is kind of like art. I'm like, okay, well, as long as I got you there, we're fine. <laughs> but, but you think, think about this, like this. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, go ahead. No, I want to hear your thought, Brandon. Oh, I, I think this gets to like the core of why people go get so wrapped up with like making their art into a business because it isn't just about like paying the bills. It's also about, 
having the work they do, um, having it be accepted. Cause as soon as you can make mm-hmm. a living as an artist, people are like, Oh, that guy's awesome. You know, yeah. as soon as you can yep. make some money, like people that's like, that's what celebrities are. We like adore yep. celebrities and they're artists that make money making art. So yeah. it's like, we have to have, um, you know, the acknowledgement of, of, of the dollar bill for it to be okay to make art. So it's, it's so much more about just like, Oh, I need to pay the bills. It's like, I need people to accept me and what I do. So I have to like, I have to make money to make it okay that, that I'm an artist. To yeah. Justify yeah. It, right. It's, it's uh, all, it comes back to the asking for permission to be what you are. Um, I, I was, I was at a workshop here in Columbus, uh, where with a cartoonist, Carol Tyler, and um, she does a lot of autobio auto bio work, and I was very curious about, you know, participating in a workshop on that topic because it's something I've kicked around doing some like auto bio in- inspired work. But I'm, I've I'm always totally I'm totally a fan of you doing auto bio stuff. We've we've talked about <laughs> this before. We have. I hope, I hope and, it involves He Man. <laughs> <laughs> But like, I've always had my arms crossed on this going like, Harumph, I don't know about this. Cause like, and, and I, I found a way to say it to Carol Tyler as to what the, 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 the crucial juncture was, what I was stuck on. And uh, she's, she asked me and I said, well, you know, I'm not convinced that I know the difference between making art and crying in public. And, you know, mm-hmm. I don't want to do something that really amounts to me just complaining about whatever slights I, I have in my black book next to my desk, you know? Um, mm-hmm. and Carol looked me in the eye and she said, and, I, and it took me a while to really wrestle with this because she knocked me back. She said, well, it, it all starts with you giving yourself permission to be who you are at the moment. And mm-hmm. I was like, what are you talking about? That's a, that's not, that's not a tip. That's not a tool. That's not an approach. What do you <laughs> give me something I can use, you know? Uh, but like this idea that, um, because like when you talk about like this, making this money, you got to make money so that people will believe that your your stuff has value. You got to get a publisher so that people will believe they have value. You're always asking permission. Can I be a Can I be a good cartoonist, yeah. please? You know, it's like, well, give yourself permission to be a good cartoonist, and then just say what you have to say, right? And it's like yeah. that's it's a simple expression, but I, at least I, this Midwestern boy has a devil of a time wrestling with that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, but I think it's it's really. There's something more to it than just giving yourself, I mean, giving yourself permission is, is a big part and that takes a lot of courage, but it sure helps a whole lot to have another cartoonist look at you and say like, Hey, be whoever you are. You oh know? my gosh. And I think yeah. that whole idea about, about having a community, even if it isn't the community at large, but having a community that respects you and that mm-hmm. can create that sacred space for you like that, that's like completely essential to really being able, I mean, people can do it, but it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's much harder but having yeah. someone else say like, yeah, I agree too. I agree. It's okay to be that and, and yeah. to not necessarily make money being that. Um, yeah. Yeah. We, we need more of that conversation too, for sure. Because that is the yeah. number one conversation. All of my students' parents come at me. They all mean well, but they're, the first question is, well, can, <laughs> can they really do this for a living? And then I think about yeah. what the therapist said to me. I'm like, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And I, I mean, this is something I have this, I have this, uh, have this idea for a book that hopefully I'll, mm. I'll get out the door someday, but that's kind of one of the things I want to be able to communicate is that when we have those conversations, you know, yes, you can, you can make, you know, make a living being an artist. Like I've fortunately been able to do that most of my life, but also understanding that, that that's something different than, being an artist in a different sense. Like the idea of being an artist in in the sense of creating something that's expressive of who you are, um, that you feel is kind of singular to yourself, you know, expressing your own voice, getting a job, drawing pictures is different than doing that type of work, you know? Mm -hmm. And so being able to, to separate those two things for people and say like, Oh, can my kid make money doing this? And to be like, they can, but this could also be about something else, you know, yeah. to be about um, providing some other good or some other sense of value to their life than than making money. So, well, because um, the, the act of doing it is it integrates your own thoughts too. I don't want to call it necessarily therapeutic because I'm not a mental health specialist, but um, yeah. but it, it seems like there's something akin to therapeutic value in through the making of the thing. Um, yeah expressing ideas that you haven't fully articulated into some kind of articulation that that's, that's gotta be good for your brain. 
Yeah, I think it's therapeutic. I also, I mean, the way I like to think about it is, I like to just, just say it's spiritual. It's it's not about yeah. providing for the needs to survive. It's about yeah. um, making life worth living and and giving life meaning and um, you know all those intangibles that ah, I was just gonna say that purpose. yeah. <laughs> that, that line, that line from Miracle on 34th Street, those intangibles, right? Like Ka- Maureen O'Hara's character is all like, well, it's not practical. And he's like, well, yeah, but you know, it's those intangible things that make life uh, valuable and worth going through in the first place. Uh, hmm, Frank Capra, man. I don't think I've ever seen that. That's, that should be something I should, I should probably go watch. <laughs> well, it, it's, it's Capra. So you're going to get, you know, a lot of Capra-ness in it, but, um, yeah. oh, but I mean, there, there's the, the part that like, is like totally like a jersey trigger is there's a scene where santa claus is like doing because it's, it, you know the premise right it's like it's santa claus for real but he becomes the macy's santa claus for one year yeah. um uh but he's like he's sitting up there doing the whole kid on the lap what do you want for christmas and this little girl comes up and he starts talking to her and she doesn't respond and the, mo- and the mother's like i'm sorry she's dutch she doesn't speak english i tried to tell her but she wouldn't listen she said that you were santa claus and he immediately starts speaking dutch to her and this yeah. kid falls apart and then like they, she's sitting on his lap and they're talking to, and it's like, it, that is like, Oh my God, I cannot take it. I completely fall to pieces. Every time I see that scene, this, this whole idea what is, of, what is it that's yeah. so good about that scene? Um, well, you're going to somebody, do it anyway. Well, yeah, I was, <laughs> <laughs> it's I like, I can feel it. I can feel it, but I can't, I, you, you can artic- probably have articulated it before. So you, you go ahead and uh, it, it's it's this idea of well it, it's it's that um, uh, illicit love right this idea of of like somebody who just has um, like absolute regard for all living creatures wherever you're from right there's a line yeah. in um, the life and adventures Santa Claus is another important character to me and like the idea the life and adventures of Santa Claus one of his uh, underlings or his elves says to him is like what you're making toys for the rich kids she doesn't need any toys and he's like well rich or poor children are children you know and it's yeah. like it's like that kind of like Aww. that kind of respect that yeah. kind of res- respect for for especially children um, yeah so like that that's that's super important to me too but but also like just that idea of like having that uh uh his superpower is making kids happy <laughs> yeah well it's just in that moment he's able yeah. to make her feel important like she matters and, you know important and seen and yeah and like yeah, yeah. and like um a conversation ann and i've been having as we're house shopping is like uh, high on my list of of things to look for is like are there trick-or-treaters and we got into a conversation <laughs> about it and i said well you know the one, I never got to actually give out trick or treating because, like, at the places I lived, there there weren't trick or treaters, and so, but like the idea of children coming to my door in costumes that they like really fussed over and they're really proud of, you know, <laughs> and then I get to make a fuss over them. I get to tell them, "You are the coolest kid in the whole world right now. Here's candy." <laughs> <laughs> like, there's something so pure and wonderful about that transaction. They walk away feeling yeah. better. I get a little bit of entertainment. You know, it's like, it's the best of all worlds. It's this, it's this time of year where they get to express exactly who they are, you know, and if yeah. you can manage that. And I get to know. say like, yeah. And I get to say that is awesome. I fully accept yeah. it. And I think you are terrific and I'm rewarding you with sugar. <laughs> <laughs> and you're in a great position because, uh, you like may actually notice some of the, th- you like recognize some of the things. You know? Oh, that's the best. That's the be best. Like, yeah. You're like, oh, you're you're dressed up as like Zuko. Do you remember an episode? You know, whatever when he does oh this. Gosh. You know, I that don't know if that is dress up like Zuko, but I, I that is one of the, my favorite things about teaching fifth grade and sixth grade is that I'm into all the same stuff as them. So when we start talking, and then when I get into the weeds with them on details about certain mm-hmm. things, and then their parents are waiting for them to go home, they're like, come on, we got to go. I'm like, well, I'm not done talking about <laughs> the Bumblebee movie with Jersey. You know, did you love so. the Bumblebee movie? I did. I liked it a lot more than I thought I was going to. I was. I oh, walked in. I was in, so delighted by that. Yeah, I, I walked in ready to hate it because I tried watching the other Michael Bay movies. I mean, I really did give oh, it a yeah. shot, and it was like it was like it, when you have like too too spicy food. You know, you're like ah, get it out, get it out. Yeah, it felt like that watching it. Um, but the Bumblebee movie, like, I mean, the part when he says he plays the Smiths uh, lyric, I would hate anything to happen to her to Charlie when yeah. she was about to go do a brave thing. Oh my gosh. Um, 
Yeah, it was it was sweet. It was it was everything I loved about the character and that he's like the small cute one who is like the most yeah. vulnerable. And they make him extra vulnerable by taking away his voice so he can't talk and he has yeah. to learn a new way to communicate. How does he learn through the human? Um so I've been doing this Transformers podcast where I'm like episode by episode analyzing the entire series of the Gen 1 series. Oh, and, cool. And one of the hypotheses I've concluded after watching all of season one and now into season two is that whether the writers meant to do it or not, there's an implicit suggestion that the Autobots always make better decisions when there's a human present. Um, Interesting. It, it keeps happening. And I, and I, I made a point of like highlighting those parts where that happens. But like when there's no humans present in the episode, the Autobots make some really silly mistakes. Um, but then when huh. Spike or Chip Chase are there, like they're always like a little bit better uh, as people. And then there's this one episode that ends with like Bumblebee, like wondering what it'd be like if an Autobot could be a human. I'm like, that's exactly the right question. Because like, so what, what do you what do you think that's what, all about? Well, not to get all Peterson about it, but um, <laughs> do it, but, get Peterson. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm gonna start like like railing on left wing people. Yeah. Yeah, you got to get a lot more strident to get the tone right, but you <laughs> know. get really angry. I, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> um, he's not angry. He's just passionate about his yeah, ideas. That's true. Um, yeah. But like, there, like, there's a question that rises that that is a natural question to ask. Like, if you're a sentient race of machine people who are thirty feet tall, you have ex, like advanced technology. You're millions of years old. Why would you consort with these weird little flesh people uh, who have no? offensive or defensive capabilities they are technologically way behind you um what purpose can they serve well is it just it's like a pet is like you know like having a kitten or something like that it's not that because like bumblebee relies on spike right and so the utility has to come out of the fact that there's something about their frail their frailty and the way that they have to contend with that frailty that makes their worldview superior to these gigantic Mm. war machines um yeah. And and what is that what does that frailty lead to? Well, it means that we're much more aware that kindness, compassion and uh gentleness of spirit like are much more effective tools in engaging with a dangerous world than just having the biggest gun, right? Yeah. Um so I mean that that's that's like I'm reading way into what, but, but at the same time, I would make an argument that like we are creatures of the culture in which we live and we're going to write about the stuff that we're experiencing and seeing. Oh, right. I'm, I'm a total believer that, that people, when they create art, they unintentionally reveal truth that a lot of times yeah. they just like, they aren't even aware of the things that they're revealing, but they just like from being part of the culture, they're a part of, you know, um, what's the way to say it? Like subconsciously they feel, they can feel something that needs to be said or, you know, it's like how many, there's all these like superhero stories that are all about like mad scientists and are all about like, um, you know, misuse of technology. And and it's like, I don't, I don't know if anyone intentionally was like, we have to be really concerned about how we use technology and the implications of technology and the kind of people wielding that power, but it's come come out in all of these contemporary stories about, you know, mad scientists creating things that are destructive and doing like when they're selfish, what happens with it? And um, yeah, yeah, right. Like like Frankenstein comes out right around the time of the Industrial Revolution, right? Like right around yeah. the same time. Um, so you, you're seeing something happening. Well, I mean, like, and Tolkien made no secret out of the fact that like Isengard was his sort of. Um, uh, indictment of the mechanized world that we were entering, right? Mm. Um, I mean, that was that was much more explicit and intentional. But yeah, you can't help but re- respond to the world in which you're living. And so, like to say, like I, I don't see that nothing. I don't. I don't see an inherent slight in saying something is of its time. <laughs> you mean it yeah. has a context? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, and there's there's wis- there's wisdom that's that exists in things, whether it's intentional or not, you know? Yeah. And sometimes when people are just like having fun, cause I, I'm, I mean, you probably know more about the history than I do. I'm sure you do, but I'm sure these creators of transformers, these weren't some like philosophic, like philosophers and sages. They were just like, let's do something fun for kids. Yeah. You know, and they're yeah. just having a good time. And it's yep. just, there's this subconscious wi- wisdom that just emerges as you try to like tell a good story, you know? Mm hmm. Yeah, what would what would kids like to watch? What what did I like to watch when I was a kid? Let's do something in that in that spirit in that vein. Um, yeah, and and yeah, so like I, I've I've taken it as a habit when I go to. So here's another admission I get to make is I go to He Man conventions on uh-huh. purpose, 
and I get to go meet the writers of these shows. And I've made a habit out of when I approach them, I point to the thing that I think that they did was brilliant. I point out the brilliance of it. And I said, I know you meant to do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I don't say like, did you mean to do that? Like, oh, I know that you did this with every intentionality to delight me yeah. and to enrich my life as a child. Oh. So thank you. And that they get to have the satisfaction of having, you know, brilliance bestowed upon them. <laughs> and I get the satisfaction of them not correcting me that they were just trying to do a job. <laughs> but, you know, part part of coming to that understanding is a little bit liberating because it means as an artist, yeah. you don't need to like think so hard about things, you know, you can kind of, yeah. you can, can kind yeah. of trust, trust a little bit in the fact, I mean, you have to develop skill, you know, you have to, you have to learn yep. the skills to, to, to do this stuff. But at some point you can kind of just trust in the fact that like, you know, tell a good story and it's going to, you know, the, everything's going to be work, going to work out in the end. All the details will all be resolved, you know? Yeah. Yeah. If anything, like, I think, um, like when people talk about like, Oh, it's very hard. I agree. I think the hard part now for me is contending with the doubt and questioning that I do of myself hmm. more than anything else. It's not about, can I draw this or can I not draw that? I'll figure it out. Yeah. If it's something I've never drawn before, I'll figure it out. And if it's like, should it be a six panel grid or a nine panel grid? I'll figure that out. That's that's not an insurmountable problem. Yeah. The problem is, do I trust myself to say what I think I want to say? Yeah. That's the part that's hard. Yeah, that's hard. And it's there's always this, this doubt of like, am, is this the best way to do this? Am I missing something? Is that, you know... I kind of drove myself crazy on the yeah. last or, um, pitch I was working on doing that where I was just like trying to have it, trying to make it be too much, you know? Um, mm. but. Yeah. Did, what, what was the moment that you knew that you were doing too much? Uh, or was there a moment? I don't know. Maybe it was kind of maybe <laughs> after I decided that I couldn't do the project. So I actually, I, <laughs> I finished this pitch and I was, I was very proud of it. I mean, I'm, I'm happy with that. You, 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 did you see any of the Get Out of Turk stuff I did? I, I thought I might. I did. I saw the art. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. I, I did it some art. For, I don't know if I ever saw the full pitch. Yeah. Can't remember if I, I sent you the pitch or not, but I was happy with it and, and I actually got a publisher that uh, agreed to publish it. But um, the place that we were kind of financially at that, that point where it was just like, you know, and he's pregnant and I, I really can't commit to this thing that may not have a financial payoff. Um, I had to kind of let it go, you know, and as I, I spent most of last mm -hmm. year, I'm kind of ashamed to say, considering like, well, yeah, the, the line share of last year, just writing this thing, a lot of stuff that no one's ever going to see for this, this project. Mm -hmm. Um, but then just kind of realizing, and, and when they did accept it, they're like, okay, we want to do it, but it can, it can be only be like four it needs to be a four issue miniseries. And then kind of being like, oh, I'm, I'm planning mm -hmm. on doing, uh, Akira. And I need to, I, I need to scale it down to, to four issues and kind of realizing like, oh my gosh, I've got so much. I need to just boil down the story make it way simpler. And wow. Um, but anyway, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure the next time I'll, I'll be working on any type of comic project, honestly, but. Oh, that's tough, man. <laughs> So was it, was it, I mean, like, was that experience like that? Was it because it was like, oh, that was such a painful goodbye to that that you're saying or is it just like, like you're just not convinced that you want to do comics right now it just doesn't fit with where i am in life right now so there's there's just mm. like not space for it and i mean i'm mostly i'm mostly okay with that I'm, I'm open to doing it again in the future it's just um like it's it's not practically feasible like i, I don't have an office i don't have any place to work i don't have i don't have any place set up where i can even draw you know, um, and obviously mm. I've got the kids in the house, which makes it tougher. Um, I mean, I could, I mm -hmm. could do something, but it would take a long, long time. I would finish like a, a page a week or something, you know? <laughs> um, yeah, that's, that's, that's a lot of slow creep for something that, that especially like the length of Akira, you're talking the rest of your life. Yeah, really. Absolutely. If you even are able to finish it. So comics take a lot yeah, of work. No, kids. Uh, and 
the 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 way I've been trying to wrestle with this is something Chris Schweitzer said on Twitter a while back. That was like I I actually need to reach out to him and thank him for this because he completely upended my cart and got me to thinking in a new way about it. Is he said that you know advances are so darn small and you have to live off of them for the the the, the length of your project. Um, why not work on a style that's suited for speed? Yeah. Try to ma- maximize speed without giving up any quality. Yeah. Or, and because of that that that. You know, I was like, well, can I do that? And so I landed on this style. I did this pitch, uh, which I've been sharing some art here and there for called Baron Von oh, yeah. Bear. Yeah, you showed um, with me. And, oh, that's right, I did. And like those pages were like two hours to ink. Oh, nice. And maybe hour, hour and a half to so to color. Like that's flats to colors. Um, and it was all about like, what's the minimum I can use to get some results on this thing and get it to look, and, and granted, the style is tied to the type of story it is too. I don't think I could use the style on just any book, but um, that whole book was an experiment in like, how can I maximize speed so that, yeah, it'd be great to do a book. God, I hope no editors are listening. It'd be great to do a book uh, like in (laughs) six months, right? (laughs) Like give me the advance for the year. I'll do the book in six months and I could do something else, you know, (laughs) in the meantime. Shh. No one's listening. Because that's the all, all the things, all the things I've said that I would not want editors and publishers to hear, to hear when I was saying them. <laughs> but but like that's that's the kind of reality that you face with comics too. Is because yeah, like the thing that I I used to I, I it's the same sentence I said ten years ago, but I I mean it in different ways now. It's like comics asks so much of you. Oh yeah, you know, and. And like 10 years ago, I said it like like with a, a straight back, <laughs> like with a salute, you yeah. know? And now I say like, be careful. Come it's a lot of I, It's more of a slump now. <laughs> more of a weary slump. I mean, it's... It's it's more like, you know... Yeah. There, there definitely are payoffs. They're <coughs> probably not going to be monetary, mm. but, you know... Um, yeah. I definitely don't regret uh, any any stuff I did. So I pretty, pretty can pretty happily say that. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, well, maybe this uh, is a good place to kind of wrap up. What do you think? Okay. Well, thank you so much for letting me be uh, not only a guest on your show, but I guess this is the first one. Yeah, huh? this is the first one. So this is kind of testing things. I'm like way away from my mic now, so it probably got like super quiet. <laughs> Work out the kinks. I, I heard you loud and clear. Think, see how things go. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I, I definitely wanted to do it with someone that I felt like I could – more more safely kind of confidently just just jump into things and not have to worry so much about about who i had to be so um i thought it was a lot of fun we could have gone we could have gone for you know if we were at a convention we could have gone for hours more just talking about the stuff i know (laughs) we have (laughs) well that's not to say that we can't do it again in here or there or anywhere for sure let's do it again so cool all right well um maybe we'll catch up just a little bit after we we wrap this up yeah. All right. Sounds Thanks good. again, Jersey. You've been listening to How to Be an Artist. To support this podcast, you can go to patreon.com forward slash H2BNA.